Do the heavens oppose me? Did I piss you off, heavens? <laughs> Finally, we are back with more rants. For those of you joining us for the first time, Rants is the long-running flagship series of adult games made by Japanese developer Alisoft with the goal of parodying the high fantasy RPG genre of video games. To put it simply, they took the stereotypical overpowered hero and made him a bit less than heroic. Today, we're looking at Rants 5D, the sixth major installment in the Rants series and the first official entry into the modern canon. And don't worry, I'll explain what that means shortly. But real quick, if you end up enjoying the content, please consider liking the video and subscribing because believe it or not, it actually helps me out beyond just satisfying my pathological need for validation from strangers on the internet. There's also Twitter, Discord, and Patreon linked below, and if you use super thanks to leave a highlighted comment, I will read it out in my next video. And please do show some love to Bruce Gone Loose who did that glorious intro at the beginning of the video. His channel is linked below. So I know that a lot of returning viewers probably have one burning question on their minds. Where's the Kichi Quo Rants video? Yes, it's technically speaking non-canon spin-off, but it is important. And the short answer is, it's coming, but I need more time. I had a couple of delays on my end, and I figured that getting a video out on the much shorter Rants 5D would be better than another huge wait in between uploads. Okay, good. So earlier in the video, I mentioned that Rants 5D is the first entry in the modern canon. What exactly does that mean? Well, to explain, let's talk a bit about the history of this crazy-ass series. Rants 1 released all the way back in 1989 on the PC-98 and had all the jank you'd expect from an adventure game of that era and then some. But the humor and general silliness of it all resonated with people, so the series continued into the 90s with Rants 2 introducing the four witches who would become major players in the story moving forward. Rants 3 started pushing the story forward, exploring the geopolitical conflict between the nations of Lazus and Hellman and how all that interacts with the supernatural parts of the world. And of course, Rance gets himself involved with all of this. Rants 4 expanded on the lore and world building of the Rance universe with giant magical robots and the persecution of and from magic users throughout history. With each new entry, the series expanded and grew more and more ambitious. This was Alisoft's flagship series, and it's clear they cared about it. But they eventually started facing financial troubles that were serious to the point where the future of the company was uncertain. So they decided that if their time was up, they'd go out with a bang, and they wanted Rance, their baby, to have a conclusion. And thus came Kichiquo Rance in 1996, almost universally agreed upon as the best of the retro titles, and many argue that it holds its own even against the modern titles, which generally speaking are much more fun to actually play. But fortunately, Alisoft pulled through. Kichikuo Rants sold amazingly well, and the company was able to make it through their troubles, and they went on to make plenty of other games. After some time, they decided they wanted to keep making more Rants titles. But since the series already got a conclusion, they ended up retconning it, making Kichikuo Rants officially non-canon, and they began working on this big, epic adventure game to relaunch the series. It didn't quite work out and was scrapped. But they went back to the drawing board and tried again. And failed again. And again. Eventually, they realized that they needed to scale back if they wanted to actually release anything, so they made a shorter, simpler, less ambitious game which released in 2002 as Rants 5D, so named because the failed titles were 5A through C. Rants 5D acts as a soft reboot of the franchise, retconning Kichikuro Rants, and though it doesn't really push the story forward at all, it sets us on a new path forward. And a decade later, Alisoft would remake the first and third Rants games and remaster the second, ultimately deciding that the remakes and 5D Onward would be the official canon, whereas the retro titles up to and including Kichikuo Rants would be their own separate timeline. A remake of Rants 4 was planned at one point, but it never got very far, leaving the original 4 in a weird place. So the development of Rants 5D was a clusterfuck, to put it mildly. It was messed up to the point that the name of the game itself is a reference to the obstacles they faced on the way. And while that makes for a great marketing campaign, there's a reason I spent the last five minutes talking about the development and history of this game. If you watch my videos, you'll know that I typically talk about development stuff as like a footnote if I even mention it at all. But in this case, the development issues fundamentally changed the identity of what Rants 5 was supposed to be, and it's hard to give the game a fair valuation without keeping it in mind. Rants 5D is a very stripped back game. The scale is more on par with Rants 1 than anything that came to the series since. The gameplay is not super complex, and the story doesn't really do anything special or push the story forward in any meaningful way, aside from introducing a few characters who I'm sure will feature in future games. So I need you to keep all that in mind as I tell you about this game. So let's get started, shall we? One thing about Rance 5D that needs to be mentioned is that it's the first game in the series to release for Windows, and with it came a complete makeover. For starters, it was at this time that Alisoft employee Orion took over as chief illustrator for the series bringing it from the pixel art of the PC-98 titles to the more anime-esque style that's become common in visual novels and weeb games. While I do like pixel art in general, I do have to say that I think Orion's work on the series was ultimately an upgrade from what came before. 
The music itself also got a bit of an update as well, no longer being limited to a 16-bit audio system. Of course, this is mostly going to be down to personal preference, but I think the soundtrack of Rance 5D absolutely slaps. In particular, I like Turns Beat, which is the main battle theme, though I have to acknowledge the amazing meme potential of the track Japanese Beat, because of how after almost every event you'll hear, Pipe up the motherfucking beat. So all in all, the series got not only a soft reboot, but a stylistic overhaul as well. So with that out of the way, let's get into gameplay. I'm going to set the stage a bit here. You really need to be in the right mindset to really grasp the core of Rance 5D. So imagine you're playing Skyrim. You're running a stealth archer build because of course you are, you fucking normie. You see an enemy, take aim, the arrow flies true, and you deal damage to the enemy. But you're not satisfied. You say, no, there is far too much player input happening here. And you end up playing Morrowind because of how arrows will have an additional RNG hit chance on top of you having to actually aim properly in the first place. You just can't function without the rush of leaving everything to chance. You're a gambling addict who hasn't discovered loot boxes yet. If that sounds like you, you're gonna fucking love Rants 5D. See, the overwhelming majority of what you'll be doing in-game hinges on RNG. Aside from the relatively brief puzzle-esque segments, just about everything is at the mercy of literal dice rolls and roulette spins. Even the game director Tada himself says that if you succeed in this game, you're lucky. Okay, so let me step back a bit and explain how the various systems actually work. Rants 5D is split up into five chapters. Each chapter will have an introductory sequence that has a very retro adventure gamey kind of feel. You know, where you have to scour the area, talking to people, finding items, and interacting with the environment to figure out how to trigger the story flags. Once you muddle your way through, you'll find the roulette wheel. It may look pretty complicated, but it's actually pretty easy to get a hang of. Your goal is to get through all five events in the chapter before the timer at the top of the screen runs out, and as you can imagine, every action you take will cost time. If you run out of time, it's game over, though it refills at the start of each chapter. To progress through the game, you'll have to spin the roulette wheel to land on the colored orbs, which correspond to different things that'll happen. Green is the event, and it'll generally be your prime target. Blue is an empty room. You can do stuff to maybe get some loot, and the space will also let you power up Galmons. I'll talk about that later. Yellow is a treasure chest. You can use a key if you have one, or pray to RNGesus to get some loot. Orange is an enemy. You'll have to either fight it for loot and experience, or run. Red is a trap which will fuck with you a bit. Purple is a summoning device which you can use for guaranteed fights. If you use it up entirely, you'll get some loot. White is situational, but you'll usually just end up with a treasure chest. And black is Kudupistan, which will let you view the history of the inhabitants of the planet Kudupistan and... who oh boy, it is something. Again, I'll get to it later. So given that this is a roulette wheel, this phase of the game must be entirely RNG dependent, right? Well, yes and no. You actually have three options when it comes to spinning the wheel, that being normal, slow, and careful. Normal will follow standard roulette rules. The wheel will spin and whatever you land on, you get. Slow has an additional time cost, but the spin will cover three consecutive orbs which you can then choose from. Careful has an even greater time cost, but covers five orbs. And normal spins also gain additional benefits to add in an extra risk versus reward factor. For starters, normal spins will increase the number of event orbs over time, acting as a soft form of bad luck mitigation. Furthermore, if you happen to get the same type of orb in three consecutive normal spins, you'll get some sort of reward. It could be good loot, an easy fight that grants a shitload of XP, or something like that. Essentially, an extra incentive to leave things up to chance. When you're in a situation where you have to actually do something like opening a chest, disarming a trap, or searching an area, you'll have a set of random rolls to determine success. There will be 10 individual coin toss-esque rolls that'll each be green for good or red for bad. Each thing you try to do has a certain required number of good rolls for the action to succeed, and most of the time, repeated attempts have looser requirements for success. Each attempt takes up one-fifth of a time bar, same as most other actions. Not too much to say here. It's more interesting visually than a simple percentage roll, but that's essentially what it is. So, as I mentioned, the goal is to complete all the events before time runs out, but you don't want to just rush them down. You do actually want to spend as much time as possible empowering yourself with experience and gear so that the various mandatory combat encounters don't completely wreck your shit. So oftentimes, you may actually want to choose something like a combat encounter over an event if you've got plenty of time to spare. So speaking of combat, let's talk about it. The combat of Rance 5D is 100% RNG dependent, or at least it is from when the fight starts to when it concludes, though your actions and decisions leading up to each combat encounter allow you to influence said RNG. The fights themselves are party versus party, with Team Rance having up to three combatants that you can freely choose from before the fight starts. Note that the party can be any composition you'd like, and Rance himself doesn't even have to be in the party if you don't want him to be. Every combatant on both sides has six slots for abilities arranged in a column. 
Every turn, a big die will roll in the middle of the screen, and the number it lands on determines which row of abilities every combatant will use. So if the die rolls a 5, every combatant will use the ability in their 5th slot, with speedy characters moving first, yada yada. This continues until one side is completely wiped out. One nice change from many of the other Rance titles is that Rance losing all his HP is not an immediate game over. While he will be knocked out of the fight, afterwards he regains normal functionality, albeit only having a sliver of health. Same goes for all the other story characters, such as Syl, Athena, Felis, and others who I'll mention later on in the story section of the video. As far as the fights themselves go, there's not really much more to talk about. I mean, there is literally zero player input going on here. Your party will attack, defend, heal, and everything else completely automatically. But what I can talk about is how you prep for these fights. And let's start with skills. So as mentioned before, each character has six skills, and for starters, you can adjust their configuration however you'd like. So for example, if you have multiple characters with healing capabilities, you may want to make sure that you have them heal on different numbers so it's less likely for one of the heals to be wasted. Or at one point, I was fighting a boss who had a strong defensive ability on slot 1. At the time, that was where I had the very strong Rance attack, which is not ideal since defensive abilities reduce damage by a shit ton in this game. So the smart move there would be to switch Rance attack to a different slot and adjust the rest of the party so that they do healing and support stuff in that slot. Another way you influence things is via the skills you learn as you level up. For starters, all story characters have a primary class and a secondary class that each level up independently and you choose which one will be gaining experience. The biggest difference between them is the skills you'll learn via level up. For example, Rance's primary class will give him physical skills such as attack and defend, while his secondary class will open up magical options. And the same kind of thing can be said for the other story characters, allowing you to specialize or have a mix of your choice. Once you find out what each class actually does, of course. Now here's the thing, every character has exactly 6 skills at all times, no more, no less. So every time you gain a new skill from leveling up, which doesn't happen every level by the way, you have some decisions to make. You have three options when you get a new skill. You can replace an existing skill, you can upgrade a skill if it's of the same type, so if you get attack 1 from level up and put it on another attack 1, you get attack 2. Or if you don't want the skill, you can just discard it. It doesn't feel super intuitive at first, but once you get a handle on how everything interacts, it starts to get exciting. Especially with how the upgraded magic skills turn into AoE nukes against anything that isn't a Hanny. The only real downside here is that you don't really know what's going to unlock when, and you certainly don't start out knowing what the different classes unlock. You'll be in a pretty solid position if you decide to do a second playthrough, but your first time around, it's almost like there's an additional layer of RNG there. Another factor for how you influence the game is gear and items. It's pretty simple all things considered. You gain items by killing enemies, opening chests, and interacting with the environment. Equipment follows a mostly linear progression scale, where some pieces of gear very obviously outshine others and can be obtained in plus one and plus two variants. There is a rudimentary degradation mechanic where after a certain amount of fights, that piece of equipment will break, drastically reducing its stats. However, you'll find replacements often enough, and there is a random event you can use to repair equipment, so it shouldn't be an issue. You'll also find a variety of items that are all mostly self-explanatory. There's healing items, items you can use to disable certain types of traps, keys to unlock chests, and a variety of other things that are generally explained pretty well by the item description. For example, there's an item that'll passively heal you every turn in combat. There's stuff to influence dice rolls. There's ropes to capture Galmons. Again, more on that later. The one thing is that you do have a limited inventory, and I definitely had to pick and choose constantly. You really can't have everything from healing, to keys, to quest items, to backup equipment, and everything else you could want. And you can even get bad luck and be stuck with junk items which the game describes as useless but you can't bring yourself to get rid of it. I'm not a huge fan of inventory management in general, but when I play video games I tend to hoard shit so I'm definitely biased. It's a perfectly fine system that's just not really my thing. Okay, I know I've teased it a few times, so let's talk Galmons. If you're not familiar, in the Rance universe, monsters are a part of the world and they're very sexually dimorphic. The males are Gaimons, who are more or less standard JRPG fare. You know, cannon fodder monsters that you fight along the way. The females are Galmons, and they are fuckable. I mean, there is a bit more to it, but that's pretty much all you really need to know. Each game uses Galmons a bit differently. For example, in Rance 3 you could use the Assault command on a low health Galmon in order to get a collectible CG. Rance 5D has probably my favorite Galmon system in the series so far. So Rance has a skill called Capture. When used against a Galmon, Rance will attempt to capture it. The base form of the skill has a chance to miss, while the upgraded form will always hit. If a Galmon is successfully captured, it's a one hit KO, and if you have a capture rope in your inventory, the Galmon will become an item in your inventory. Capture will do nothing if used against a non-Galmon or against certain boss fights. And amusingly, there's one fight in particular where capture will instantly give you a game over. No, I'm not telling you which one because I want you to suffer. 
Once a Gaomon is in your inventory, you can then add it to your party as a combatant, and the different Gaomons can be anywhere from borderline useless to game-breakingly overpowered. And if you're able to capture the right one, you can straight up one-hit the final boss. Gaomons function a bit differently than your standard party members. For starters, they cannot be directly healed, so Syl will never target them for healing, healing items won't work on them, and resting outside of combat will do nothing for them. They can be healed indirectly, so items like the one that gives passive healing every turn will help you keep them alive. Furthermore, Gaomons cannot gain experience or level up. The only way to increase their power is to have them in your party and roll a blue orb, at which point Rance will train them by basically bullying them. I know I said it already, but I really like this system, and it feels like for the first time the Gaomons actually have a proper place in the game. They serve an actual purpose rather than just being a neat little bit of flavor for the world. It's fun to try to capture different Gaomons and see what they can all do in combat. It's all really good stuff. Now, the different ways of influencing your RNG aren't all necessarily super helpful right up front, given that once you start a fight, everything is locked in. However, once the intricacies of the game started to make sense, I felt much more engaged, and with the game's generous autosave and checkpoint system, I never found myself in a situation where I was just completely fucked. Even when I would find myself in an encounter I was woefully underprepared for, I could always tweak things and try again with ease. Overall, the gameplay of Rance 5D is actually way more satisfying than it has any right to be. The fights are fun to watch even though they're pure RNG. That being said, I have two major problems with the game. The first is something that's pretty much standard fare for Rance at this point. The game is incredibly obtuse and its various systems are not explained to you in any way, shape, or form, which is not ideal when you're expected to utilize said systems. I was more than halfway through the game before I realized you could switch between classes. I didn't realize at first that you could rearrange your skills. I still don't really know what the stat bars on your equipment are supposed to represent. This game is seemingly designed to be played after having read the manual, which never got localized. While I do love Alisoft as a developer, their older titles always had this problem, and I think that if a game can't be intuitively understood by the players, that's bad game design. Even now, after I've beaten the game, some of the systems are still kinda confusing, and I don't like that. My second problem with the game stems from a game design concept that I haven't really been able to talk about on the channel up till now. While I do enjoy a pretty wide variety of games, there are a few genres that I rarely touch. Some of these include Grand Strategy, 4X, and Real Time Strategy, because they share an issue with Rance 5D, and yes, I'm aware that I'm comparing Rance 5D to games like Civilization and StarCraft. And that issue is delayed feedback loops. So here's what that means. Pretty much every game in existence provides you with feedback for every action you take. If you get hit, your character will lose health. If you shoot an enemy in the head, you'll deal extra damage. That kind of thing. Games are constantly telling you when you're doing well and when you're doing poorly, and this provides you with a loose sense of direction when it comes to improving. The issue with something like a real-time strategy game is that the consequences of your action are often seen a lot further down the line. Failing to efficiently manage your resources in the early part of the game can fuck you over 20 minutes later, but all you know is that you're being overwhelmed. There's no obvious cause and effect there, and that massively ramps up the skill floor, making it much harder to really get into the game. Rance 5D has a lot of that going on. I was making all these decisions involving my skills and items and playing around with different types of spins, but I had no fucking clue if I was playing well or not. I had no clue if I was making the right choices and prioritizing the right things. I just kinda had to hope that I wasn't gonna run into a brick wall. Even though certain elements of the game did feel very satisfying, it was ultimately kind of hollow. Like the game's director Tada said in Alice's Mansion, I succeeded because I was lucky. Any correct decisions I made were mostly down to being lucky with an educated guess. When I came up against a challenge I wasn't really prepared for, I basically save scummed since the autosave function is incredibly generous. I'd imagine that if I played the game again, I would probably have a much easier time of things, and I'd be able to be much more efficient and deliberate in my choices. But I have absolutely zero desire to do so. I don't feel like Rants 5D has much, if any, replay value. I made my way through the game and had a decent time with it, but now I feel like after I finish this video, I'm just ready to uninstall it and never look back. Which is really a shame. I feel like Rants 5D is a game that would benefit from the knowledge you'd have on a repeat playthrough, but it also has little to no replay value. I mean, they tried to encourage repeat playthroughs with two hard modes, but they just decreased the time limit and disable autosaves respectively. I've already talked about how I hate the adjust the number style of difficulty on the channel, so I won't go into it here. Suffice it to say, I think it's lazy game design that doesn't actually provide a satisfying degree of challenge. So as far as gameplay goes, is Rants 5D fun? Yes, absolutely. Would I recommend it on gameplay alone? Questionable, but it's short enough to serve as a fun distraction for a day or two, and might actually end up being a solid entry point in the series for newcomers who don't want to play the older titles. 
which admittedly can be a bit rough at times. Of course, they may still be mandatory depending on how the future games handle the story, so I'm gonna put a pin in that for now. And speaking of story, let's talk about it. I know the signature style of this channel is the in-depth writing analysis where I talk about themes, character arcs, who the writers took inspiration from, all that nerd shit. But the thing is, the gameplay is not the only stripped down part of Rants 5D. The story is pulled way back as well, to the point where I honestly don't have all that much to talk about unless I were to just give you a point by point recreation of the plot. And as much as I know you guys love listening to my sexy femboy-esque voice, that would be a total waste of time and kill half the reason for playing Rants 5D in the first place. I will be giving you an overview of the plot, so spoiler warning I guess, but I don't think in this case that spoilers will really hurt your enjoyment of the game. So dip out if you want, but I don't think you really have to. Also, I obviously won't be going super in-depth like I normally do, but I will point out a few things that I found noteworthy. The game starts out with Rance, his slave Syl, and his android, Athena 2.0, lost in some kind of cave or dungeon. And remember that the events of Kichiko Rance have been retconned. The group is doing their best to find a way out, though more accurately, Rance is making the girls do all the work and bullying them when they fail. They continue getting more and more lost and eventually run into Rance's old rival, Bird, and his new woman, Kopendon. Kopendon is obsessed with attaching herself to someone with great luck, and she's convinced that Bird is that guy. These two do have a destination in mind, but they appear to be equally lost. Eventually, Rance and Co. find a nearly abandoned village and a mysterious Japanese-style castle guarded by supernatural warriors. After tricking their way inside, they eventually run into a girl named Rizna and her handy guardian Kagekatsu. Meanwhile, Bird accidentally sticks a Galmon assassin on Rance, not that he's complaining, of course. Fast forward a bit and we learn that Rizna is a prisoner in the castle, which has an enchantment that will always trap the last person to leave, providing them with whatever supplies they need but dooming them to an existence of lonely immortality. At the behest of Kagekatsu, Rizna tricks Rance into leaving Syl behind, though he eventually figures things out once he starts thinking with his upper brain. So he leaves her to fend for herself and goes back for Syl. Eventually, he manages to track down Bird by faking his death near that Galmon assassin and tricks him into being trapped in the castle. He also steals Kalpandon from him once she realizes that she made a mistake. Bird actually has bad luck and Rance is the one who has great luck. Yeah, checks out. Fast forward a bit and the group meets back up with Rizna who joins them after Syl immediately forgives her because Syl is a total fucking sweetheart. They all manage to escape and Rance is forced to choose between them due to limited space at his home and he picks Syl. And that's pretty much it. So as you can see, Rance 5D's story is pretty self-contained. And with the exception of introducing two new characters who I'm sure will feature in future games, not all that much happens in the way of important meta-narrative. However, there are a few things I really want to highlight. The first is how they handle the dynamic of Rance and Syl. Up to this point, we've got a general sense of how things are between the two. Syl is completely Stockholm syndrome and madly in love with Rance. Rance pretends not to care and fucks other women, which Syl is none too thrilled about, but when push comes to shove, he will do everything in his power to protect her because he does care. Well, in Rance 5D, they decided to really lean into Syl's desire for Rance, and it's made much more explicit how much it hurts her to see Rance fucking other women and how she wants a monogamous relationship with him. In past titles, she would mostly be annoyed and or disapproving, and it would generally be played off for laughs. But in Rance 5D, she gets genuinely upset. I've mentioned that Rance 5D acts as a sort of soft reboot of the franchise, and I'll be very interested to see how the dynamics expanded upon in future titles. Another thing I have to point out is that the writing in Rance 5D is really fucking goofy, even by Rance standards. Since they weren't really focusing on the wider story with this one, they seemingly went all in on funny scenes and gags. The characters are all turned up to 11, and there are funny, ridiculous things happening left and right. You can obtain matches as an item, but they're labeled as arson kits. At one point, Rance stumbles across a BDSM room, because of course he does, and he decides to make use of it with Athena 2.0, who is still such a funny dumbass and I love her. Well, when he shackles her wrists, she says, Manacles for my handicles? And let me tell you something, I fucking lost it, and that line has been living in my head rent-free ever since. Or consider the little on-screen illustration that happens when Rance whips out his cock. Obviously, I can't show it here, but it contains the words BAM and SHWING. Felis also makes a return with my favorite iteration of her yet, and she is still my favorite side character. Rance summons her to help in combat, but she's on her flux, which to the best of my understanding is basically the demon equivalent of a period, though the main symptom is basically a moderate flu. She really just wants to rest, but Rance is an ass, so she's forced to help out. And due to the overwork he puts her through, she actually starts to shrink, causing Rance to start bullying her for being tiny. And of course, I can't talk about the writing of Rance 5D without talking about the planet Kudupiston. Remember how Kudupiston was one of the orbs you could land on in the roulette wheel? Well, every time you land on it, you get to view a bit of the history of that planet, which in Rance canon does exist, but is ultimately inconsequential. 
It actually started as a one-off joke in Rants 4, innocuous to the point where I didn't even mention it in my video on the game. But I guess they just decided to roll with it in 5D. The Kudapistonians are these Microsoft Paint looking motherfuckers, and they have all this lore delivered to you in these really goofy scenes, and you get to watch the entire history of their civilization from learning how to hunt as an alternative to cannibalism, to the creation of nations and religions, to the industrial revolution and the world war, to the spread of weebs, and it's all just really fucking weird. And I felt like I was on an acid trip every time I landed on that fateful black orb. Feel free to look it up for yourself or just play the game, because it's weird even by rant standards. Of course, there's more funny things that happen, other one-off characters I didn't go into, jokes I didn't go over, but I feel like in this particular scenario, if I'm too thorough, it'll only ruin what this game has to offer story-wise. It's just simply not the big ambitious epic story that we've come to expect from the series, and that's down to the difficulties Alisoft had in development. It's a fun game with a fun story, but that story is mostly inconsequential and made up primarily of funny moments rather than a wider overarching plot. Though it does have its more serious moments, particularly when it's revealed how Rizna has been used and abused in the past in ways that are too cruel even for Rance. And of course, there's that ending where Rance has to choose between his impromptu harem and he tells Syl that this is her chance to be free of him. She can leave and be free to live her own life, no longer tied to the man that enslaved her. But she meekly says she wants to stay with him, and with his signature, yeah, he picks her, like he would ever choose another woman over Syl. Look, it's all perfectly good stuff, but I feel like my expectations were set at higher standards than Rance 5D delivered. I don't regret my time with this game, but this is currently the only mainline game in the series so far that I don't ever see myself even considering replaying. And that's just how it is. I'd recommend this game, but don't go in expecting a masterpiece. And before I give the outro, it's super thanks time. Today we've got $2 from President Irina Vladimirovna Putina. If there's one thing Octopath got right 100%, it's the art style. I've always said games like Pokemon would be far better going off for an art style like this rather than going 3D. Well, I for one completely agree. Octopath Traveler has its flaws, and pretty significant ones at that, but you can't deny that it's an absolutely beautiful game. They completely nailed the presentation there. And I also agree that Pokemon would have probably been better off sticking to 2D sprites rather than making the complete leap to 3D. For starters, I feel like in the long term, the sprites of Generation 3 to 5 will probably age better than the 3D models will. And also, having to make and remake hundreds of 3D models every generation or two is time consuming and expensive work. It would be much quicker and easier to focus on two 2D sprites per Pokemon. I'm not against 3D stuff, after all I think games like Stadium and Colosseum did it pretty well, but it really shouldn't be the focus. Thank you very much for the super thanks. If you'd like to have me read out and respond to your comment in my next video, you can use super thanks option below the video. Thanks for watching. Big thank you to my patrons, especially my god tier supporters, Bulk Squat Thrust and Michael Rotolo. And also Drago, sorry, brain fart during recording. If you'd like to join them to support the channel and get early access to future content, check out Patreon down below. So I do want to reiterate, Kichikuo Rants is coming. I just wanted to get this one out because 5D is a much shorter game and I didn't want to leave you all hanging. I can't promise that Kichikuo will be my next video and I'm certainly not promising any hard release dates, but it will be the next Rants video for sure. Make sure to like and subscribe for the algorithm, follow me on Twitter at AdsTweets, and join the Discord server linked below. With all that being said, thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Gah! <laughs>